In this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about topographical mapping, what that means, why it is a great way to visualize EEG or MEG data, and I'll talk about how to interpret the topographical maps, and also I will explain the logic of the EEG montage and the electrode labeling system that we all use. Okay, so here you see two examples of what are called topographical maps. Essentially, this shows the spatial distribution of activity of the voltage potentials or the effect size or you know whatever is the thing that you are quantifying in the data. So the way that you interpret a topographical map is you imagine that you are looking down on the top of someone's head. So this is the nose, this is the left ear, and this is the right ear. All of these black dots here correspond to the approximate physical locations of each electrode on the scalp. So this shows an electrode layout with 64 electrodes. I'll show you different densities of electrode layouts in a few slides. So these are where the electrodes are positioned on the scalp. And you can see that there are colors all uh, everywhere on the scalp between the electrodes. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that we actually didn't measure any data at this point here. So there was no data measured right here, or here, or here, or here, or anywhere in this plot, except for exactly where these black dots are. So how can we draw these colors here if we didn't actually measure any data? Well, this is done based on something something that's called interpolation. So we are just smoothly going from this electrode, the voltage value at this electrode, to the voltage value at this electrode. And we make an assumption that the voltage value changes smoothly from one electrode to the next. So that allows us to guess, basically, interpolate what the activity could possibly look like at all of the points in between all of these electrodes. So that's an important thing to keep in mind because it is possible that we are missing a lot of activity here. We are missing a lot of the spatial richness of the activity in this plot because we're not measuring from an electrode here. So maybe the electro if we had measured data here, it could look a lot different from our guess based on just measuring from this density of electrodes. Okay, so that said, what can we see in these electrodes? So, these topographical maps are used to visualize the spatial distribution of activity. They are really, really useful. They're really powerful visualization methods because they allow you to see a lot of what's happening, a lot of the richness in the data at a single time point or at multiple time points. So these two maps come from exactly the same data, just a slightly different point in time. And I would like you to pause the video and try to guess, or maybe you can do it faster than, you know, maybe you don't even need to pause the video. I would like you to guess what was happening at this time point in, in the experiment and what was happening at this time point in the experiment. So it turns out that the answer is that at this time point in the experiment, there was a visual stimulus that was shown on a computer screen. So here you see activity in posterior regions corresponding to the activation of visual cortex. So the subject, this research participant, uh, saw a picture appear on the computer screen and then their visual cortex lit up. And that's what we see here. Here, the subject made a response. They pressed a button with the right hand and we see activation of this kind of central lateral sensory motor area here. So we can already determine a lot about what's happening in the experiment just based on looking at the topographical maps. We can confirm what you know, we think should be sensible based on what happened in the experiment. All right, here you see another advantage of looking at topographical maps, and that is to identify potentially bad uh, electrodes. So what I've done here, this is actually a clean data set. This is showing the topographical maps at different time points. So the number in this box corresponds to time points in milliseconds after a stimulus onset. So that's already interesting. You can see how activity is unfolding over time. And what I've done here in this otherwise clean data set is replace one electrode with pure noise. And it's pretty obvious to see which electrode I've replaced with pure noise. So therefore, topographical maps are also an important part of data cleaning and data inspection. 
to make sure that the data uh, are all clean over different electrodes. So I'm showing you now these flat topographical maps, which is in general the way that I prefer to show topographical maps. There's a couple of different ways to view them. This, by the way, is a, is a you know not a very useful way. It is actually more accurate only to color the exact electrodes and not to color anything in between. So technically, this is more accurate because, as I mentioned a, a few slides ago, we don't actually know what's happening at this part of the scalp. We don't know what the voltage value was at this part of the scalp. However, you can see that these plots are kind of difficult to interpret. So therefore, it's better to do some smooth interpolation just to facilitate visual inspection. Okay, so these are like flat topographical maps. You can also create uh, 3D head maps that map the voltage values not on a uh, flat surface like this, but onto an actual rendering of a head. Now, on the one hand, this looks more realistic. It also looks a lot cooler, right? This is sort of like, uh, yeah, this looks like something from the 80s, and this looks a little bit more interesting to look at. But the main disadvantage of these kinds of head plots, these are called topographical plots, these are called head plots. The main disadvantage is that you can only see around half of the topographical data at once. So here we see what's happening across the entire scalp all at the same time. Here we have no idea what's happening on the other side of the head because it's, well, it's obscured by this side of the head. So of course what you can do is show two of these head plots and the other one would be, you know, you'd have a corresponding head plot. Maybe you would plot it over here and that shows just the same head with the same data rotated. So that's also possible. And if you were making figures for a publication or a presentation, then you know that could be something you could use to make the data a little bit more eye-catchy. Nonetheless, I generally prefer this simplistic but more uh, descriptive way of showing the data. All right, so here we have 64 electrodes on the head. And how do we refer to these different electrodes? You know, I, I could just point at this one and say, I'm talking about this electrode here, this electrode here, this electrode here, but that's not really a scalable method. We need some way of uh, organizing the labeling. We need some conventions to refer to different electrodes. So I can just, you know, say a name of an electrode and you would know which electrode or which region I'm referring to. And so, uh, so I'm gonna tell you about that now. So these electrode labeling conventions. So here you see a human brain with the major lobes indicated. So the skull would be out here, the eyeballs are sitting somewhere down here, and of course the neck and the rest of the body goes out here. So I introduced this here because the labeling convention, the standard labeling convention for electrodes, comes directly from this lobular organization of the uh, human cortex. So you can see that these electrodes here are given different letters and numbers, and sometimes there's multiple letters, sometimes there's only one letter, and clearly, you know, you can already see some patterns here. So this is not just a random collection of letters and numbers. So what is the organization scheme here? So the idea is that every electrode gets first a letter, or sometimes two letters, and then it gets a number. So we have a combination of letters and numbers. And the letters indicate the topographical region, so uh, we have frontal electrodes, central electrodes, parietal, occipital, and this one is temporal, and then sometimes you get these extra letters. So in this case, this would be frontal pole. You can see here is the, the frontal pole. So this is even more anterior than the F channel, so that's called FP for frontal pole. And the A here is for oral, so A-U-R-A-L, for oral around the ears. And sometimes that we mix the letters as well. So a channel that would be here, that would be in between the Fs and the Cs, that would be called Fc. So that's about the convention for the letters. And then we have the numbers. And the, the organization scheme there is that the odd numbers are in the left hemisphere. The even numbers are in the right hemisphere. So you see here is all odd numbers on the left, all even numbers on the right and they increase the further away you get from the midline. So this is one that's pretty close to the midline. Here we have three, and then we get one again, 
and here we have uh, five and then three and seven. So it can get a little bit confusing in this plot because we're actually missing a bunch of electrodes. There aren't that many electrodes shown here. And here we have the twos and then the fours and then the sixes and then the eights. And then in the center we have a Z here and that is for zenith, which is like the, you know, the very top of a dome. And again, you can figure out what would be, for example, an electrode located here. It's halfway between F and C, so this would be FC. And then the number is between 3 and Z, and it has to be an odd number. So an electrode positioned here would be called FC1. This would be FC2, FC4, FC6, and so on. So this is showing a relatively low density cap, or EEG montage. EEG electrode caps can vary in their density. They go from down to, I guess, six or eight is maybe the lowest. This one shows 256 electrodes. So here you see, this is a, uh, a styrofoam head with this electrode cap on it. So it looks a little bit like a swim cap and there's a little band under here to make sure that the cap is fitting snugly. And then you see all of these little plastic rings. These are the casings where the electrodes would sit. So you can see that 256 electrodes gets to be pretty dense. You're really getting a lot of activity in here. So 256 electrodes is kind of a lot. I would say typical EEG caps used nowadays is either 64 or 128. Sometimes people use fewer electrodes, so a, a, a montage like this, that's generally more useful in clinical settings where you might not have the opportunity to spend, you know, it can take two people 40 minutes to apply all of the electrodes to the cap here. And maybe you don't have this uh, a, a lot of time, so you, you have to sacrifice a lot of electrodes in order to get your experiment done faster. And I think in the rest of this course, we're only going to be using 64 channels, which is somewhere in between here and here. It, actually, the density looks like uh, this. So this is might be even exactly the same data set that we're going to be using in this course.